You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 444. Securing distribution is always a battle, said every filmmaker ever. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, today on the show, guys, we have film distribution expert Orly Ravid. Now, Orly has been in the film distribution space for a long time and is the founder of the Film Collaborative, where she has been fighting the good fight, trying to help filmmakers get distribution and navigate the shark-infested world that is film distribution. Her organization launched a best-selling book called Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Sold, and more recently, How Not to Sign a Film Contract. The Film Collaborative is the first nonprofit focused on distribution education, And uses three taglines that really encompasses what she believes in. Filmmakers first, nonprofit on purpose, and we don't own the rights, you do. Now, Orly and I sat down and had an amazing conversation about film distribution in today's world, what's going on with coronavirus, and how that's affecting the world, and what we as filmmakers can do to get our films out there because things are changing so rapidly. Amazon is dropping documentaries now and no short films and you know these platforms have just so much power and we need to figure out what we can do as filmmakers to make a living doing what we love so without any further ado please enjoy my conversation with orly ravid i'd like to welcome to the show orly ravid how are you doing orly i'm well how are you as good as i can be in this crazy mixed up world that we live in <laughs> <laughs> so uh thank you so much for being on the show we I, I how we have not met officially over the years since considering we're both um well our good friend Shaked, who introduced us finally um he uh he's like we need to build an avengers team uh of distribution you know fighters and and like you you know orly will be on it i'll be on it and you should be on it alex i'm like that would be awesome so how we have not literally crossed paths in all the stuff that we do individually is beyond me but it's a small world so well, you know, it's funny, as soon as Shaked introduced us and then obviously we met and, and all of a sudden it was like when you learn a new word and you see it everywhere then every all of a sudden we're like oh yeah did you hear the new indie film hustle podcast and the you know <laughs> latest episode and i was like uh-huh yep yeah yeah it's 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 yeah exactly my wife all of a sudden she's like is it just me there's a lot of teslas around i'm like she was like she was like thinking of like oh i just looked at one the other day and like yeah i'm like that'd, that'd be nice babe but not yet uh, 
<laughs> Come down. Yeah, well, she wants the big, the big uh, station wagon one. The one. Oh. Yeah, she wants the station wagon one for the family. I'm like, give me a minute. <laughs> Yoda needs his own row. His own. Obviously, uh, Yoda. Yoda, my uh, my co-pilot in life, sir. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, how did you get in the business? Oh, that's a fun question. Um, I mean, when I studied in college, I did take film courses uh, that weren't business related, but they were more sort of theor critical theory and screenwriting. And I did externships or internships, they call them, uh, that were film related, but I wasn't in the business and I didn't ever think that I would be in the business. And then I moved from Manhattan to from M Manhattan, and New York to California, although I did a quick stint in Chicago on the way. Um, and like, you know, had had other film involvements, but the first job that I ever took uh, in distribution in this town was with a international sales company. And I just thought I was going to be their office manager. That's what I, that was the job that I took. I had done some film festival programming work at Outfest and at the Israeli film festival, mm -hmm. but that was my first like job in the industry. That wasn't an internship. And the office management job turned into me creating and running the domestic distribution arm because the my boss the guy who owned the company said well international sales is was really hurt in the asian asian crisis back in the days of you know after the 80s boom and i really need some business revenue to offset any downturns in international sales and so uh could you help me launch this domestic distribution arm which i did and back then there was vhs so mm -hmm. i all those things. That's how I got started in the biz, as it were. Yes. And then after VHS, the boom of the DVD market, which was, oh man, the money was flowing, wasn't it? Oh. Yeah. And and so I was doing, I did VHS, I did DVDs, all of that stuff. And I also still did international sales. That's how I learned both aspects of the business. And at the time, folks were like, oh, you're such a go-getter. You should be an agent. But I uh, decided not to be an agent. Smart. I think smart move. I think smart move. Uh, <laughs> so with, uh, with, uh, if, if, and for people listening, you have to understand like it, when the DVD boom was happening, that's when you can make sniper six and seven and just pre-sell it. It was just done. Like yeah. all you needed to do was put it out and it was three to 5 million guaranteed. Yeah. And that, and that time was so lucrative for the business to business folks. Um, that's when, you know, deals were done on napkins and can and, it wasn't weird to have big parties and uh, it was just the cost of doing business because a lot of business was being generated and a lot of money was flowing, at least to those folks in the business. Yeah, right. Not to the filmmakers as much. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. let me, let me ask you that. Let me ask you that question because, you know, I've been, I've been yelling from the top of the, uh, the mountain for a while now that I, I feel that the, the system has a, the the film distribution side of the business has a systemic problem that has been there pretty much since the inception of the industry where distributors ha and, and and the distribution contracts and the way that whole traditional model is is set up not to pay really or not to take care of the artist not to take care of the filmmaker i mean i remember was it chaplin and um, Fairbanks and Pickford, they opened up United Artists because they got, kept getting screwed out of the business side of things. It's been going on forever. Do you think it's, it, I don't think it's getting any better. Do you? I mean, there's more knowledge out there, but I don't think it's getting any better. And why is it? Why is it that way? Because you've been in the business for a while. So I'll answer the why it is that way first, which is, um, you know, American culture is very, commercially focused. Um, we don't support our arts in this country with government and public funds generally. I mean, there's mm -hmm. some exceptions and, uh, and we don't treat distribution as a mission. We treat it as a business and people in business. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're billionaires buying up mobile home parks and evicting the tenants, uh, you know, their landlord, you know, the people who ratchet mm -hmm. up rent. I mean, big business is big business. And that's, uh, just a culture that we're in and, and with film, I think the disconnect for folks is that because independent films feel like they're doing artwork, you know, working to do something important, artistically important, culturally important, that it should be treated differently. And I agree that it should be, but if you're going to do a deal with a traditional commercial distributor, uh, I mean, they're not obviously all the same, but certainly the model is oriented to make money for the, for the, for the distributor. And, right. you know, and take rights for a very long time and that kind of thing. And it's just a different system here that we have. 
Um, that that's that's and no. better, Walmart or, or sorry, just to you know, mm -hmm. when, when, the way Walmart approaches its vendors, you know, push very hard to get the best price, and if we don't sell it, you're going to take it back, right? The business is taking care of itself. Got it. And it's just it's just the brutal nature of this this uh, at least this this in america and i know the uk is not too far behind that there's a lot of guys doing that kind of deal but internationally because you worked internationally as well is it different with distribution deals or is it like you know when you're in Cannes or at afm i mean I, these deals are similar in overseas like in france or in germany or in other major places. is that just a general way of the business is done period well yeah i mean they're the all rights distributor deals in Europe and in Asia can be for just as long of a term, um, you know, and there can be similar accounting issues. Certainly we've noticed that. <laughs> um, but at the same time, the difference is a lot of the European films are financed pu by public funds. And frankly, the filmmakers are not so worried about as long as the distribution happens, they're not so they're not always right. as getting the money back so and then there you know the, there are public broadcasters that are funded by public funds and even um sales companies that can get public support like in france and stuff so but i i will because you had a second part of the question that i didn't yet answer which is i think it is getting better not because necessarily distributors are going to well there's two things i think there is a movement uh that i i i'd like to think that i'm part of having started which is uh, creating other distribution opportunities for filmmakers that are not deleterious, that are not going to be harmful. Um, and I think that that different ethos and that different push for more transparency and for better terms has shifted the market a little bit because there are now there are services that uh, accommodate that. You know, for example, um, I love working with Giant Entertainment. I think they're they're an example of a way to get VOD distribution done without giving your rights away for a really long time. Um, but also the fact that, you know, there's a bunch of distribution folks can do themselves, right? People are booking theaters themselves. People mm -hmm. are, are, you know, getting someone on their team to do it uh, or hiring a service. Um, people can get onto VOD platforms through aggregators, which is a much safer way. There's, a, there's obviously the marketing question there. But in other words, what before... Distribution was so much more cost intensive. There was also a barrier to entry for the filmmakers, right? Mm -hmm. It was to, to make 35 millimeter prints. It was expensive to traffic them. It was expensive to, and it was, you know, gatekeeping and you weren't going to be booking theaters yourself. Although I think Cassavetes did it. So I guess you could have done it. One could mm -hmm. have done it even in the seventies, but um, now it's lo a lot less expensive to make the movie. It's also a lot less expensive to distribute it. And I'm not talking about, you know, a hundred million dollar campaign, uh, you know, on a, few thousand screens, but just for the, you know, an indie film. And that happens all the time. There's service deals, right? So the model, there's plenty of those opportunities where you can just pay for a service to help you accomplish your goals and you'll have more control and ownership and keep your ownership of the rights. So as, as uh, we're obviously in the middle of a once in a generation pandemic, which is obviously ravaging not only our industry, but the world. But specifically in our industry, how do you see COVID affecting distributors moving forward? Because my feeling is that the the financial pressure hasn't even begun yet. Uh, in my in my feeling, I think it's going to get a little bit worse. And I feel that a lot of these distributors, especially the predatory ones, will become more predatory in regards to it. And again, not all. There are good, and I always say this, there are good distributors out there, but a lot of them, these deals are very predatory. And I've been, I don't, I mean, we could talk about predatory deals that are just, oh my God, like I'm sure you've read a couple over the years. Like, how is this legal? <laughs> you know, well, but how do you see read over the years? But I mean, I've been involved with, you know, cause I'm an attorney. I've helped clients sue their distributor. Um, well, I, I, you know, I don't disagree that, um, you know, there's going to be a, an even greater desperation to have distribution by on the part of filmmakers who, you know, there's just also just so much more. I mean, I also think filmmakers are kind of going into this, not always being educated about, you know, what distribution is, how to get it, when mm. it can work and when it can't. Not every film has a big audience. Right. And that's just right. the truth. Um, I will say that distributors that I know and do deals with are seeing a surge in home entertainment consumption. Right. I mean, Fit VOD generally is, I think, up 40%. So there's a lot of um, positive impact in just in terms of extra consumption. There's also more content than has ever been produced before. And 
and the, the you know the buyers are more and more commercially oriented um and there's more emphasis on series and less on independent film um so that's the plus you know i think it depends on what you're creating that you may even have more opportunities than you would have before in terms of though um theatrical and having an impact there it's obviously tremendously diminished festivals the ability for a film to break out and launch out of a festival is tremendously diminished i mean i'm so fascinated to see what happens at sundance this year right mm-hmm. a virtual festival that, you know i mean i guess there's some live components but and there'll be virtual festivals for months to come so i think that it it creates a glut right films that were premieres at south by are meant to like premiere again and it, it's just it, it is definitely stacking the competition time several full right because there's like that many more films going to try to compete at the same time right for for for, no, for attention and for distribution and i think that's hard and i you know and i i don't know what else to say about it but i think it's going to be and i as far as predatory you know people should not sign deals with distributors without checking right you've got your podcast and your facebook group and we are going to rejigger our distributor report card early uh next year uh and then you know just always so what is can you can you tell me what the report card is yeah it's you know we have a suite of digital distribution uh, educational free services one is the digital distribution guide which is a a guide to platforms around the world that you know uh, if you made a certain kind of film you can see what platforms are available that take the film and then there's case studies and then there's a, a very information rich blog and our social media all that stuff is free information that or is oriented to VOD and distribution, distribution that oriented VOD in reverse. The distributor report card is the only thing that I started that I didn't successfully finish at the Film Collaborative because it was getting, it was meant to be the Yelp for distribution. Right. To, you know, uh, having transparent information from filmmakers who experienced st- distributor, distributors. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very hard. People just didn't want to uh, comment, didn't want to share, even when they could be anonymous. So we're doing it differently now. We're kind of just going to interview uh, distributors as well to get their representation of what they do and what they do well and what they're looking for, but also comments from filmmakers about what went well, what didn't go well, to con- and, and, and sort of synthesizing that. So instead of it being like, you know, anonymous filmmaker X, right, or, you know, naming, we're just going to synthesize it all. Um, and then I just have my own years of experience, right, like, there, and it's not all, it's not black and white. There's some distributors who are perfectly fine at this, that, and the other thing, but not the best at this or no going right. into this deal that this is what this look, this is what it ultimately is. Oh, excuse me. And then there are other distributors that are flat out predatory and like never do a deal with them straight up. Don't, don't do it. Yeah. And, and cause I've been, I've been trying to figure out a way to do something like a Yelp for distributors. Cause that's been coming up constantly in the Facebook group. They're like, Hey, is there a place where we can just go see if this is, and our Facebook group is a good is a good reference and resource because people just type in the, the, I'm like, look, just type in the name of the distributor and and the search and people will let you know. It's not hard to do research on distributors. I mean, you just got to call a few filmmakers up and they are very honest about it. Um, Exactly. I always tell every filmmaker, don't just take my opinion about what I know, my data points, call filmmakers, not just the ones the distributor told you to call, but other ones. And usually you'll hear, but I also think it's to know how to receive the information. I mean, that's part of where hearing the distributor's perspective is also useful. It's like what they're actually able to deliver and what they're promising versus what's not hmm. that they're going to do and no one is going to do. Right. And so, you know, you got to get real about what's available in the, in the marketplace as far as distribution for small films. Right. But then there's just the flat out predatory ones where like, it doesn't matter. Like just don't do that deal. And I would love to, you know, love to collaborate with you and anyone else on expand. This is a free service. that's just meant to collate yeah. Real, real, real experiences that filmmakers have had, you know, and, and across the top, we're going to focus on the U.S. first, like, you know, the top 25 to 40 companies, right. not the top, like the biggest, but rather the most commonly at issue in indie film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a couple of, and, you know, to be, you know, and I, I beat up on distributors, especially the predatory distributors a lot. But to be fair, you know, a lot of filmmakers go into a distribution deal with very un, un, unreasonable expectations because, like I say, there's never an ugly baby. There are no ugly babies in the world. Uh, and that's the same thing with, with film. Like, well, but unfortunately, the truth is, yes, there are ugly babies. And, and filmmakers don't want to hear that they just spent a year and a half making an ugly baby. And they don't want to hear that. And then, of course, who are they 
going to blame, they're going to blame the distributor, whether it's their fault or not. So that there is, there is that. Do you agree with that? Oh, hundred percent. And I, and I asked myself, or not, I don't only ask myself, I ask them. I mean, you're choosing the most expensive art medium in the world as, <laughs> as less expensive as it is now than it's been. It's always been more expensive than poetry and painting and, you know, and playing instruments and everything else. So, you know, and you're usually not just using your own money. You're usually using other people's money. And so if you're just going to give, if you're going to have a business plan around your film, that's only looking at the most successful films with anything similar, but really not, not, not a, a fair comparison with respect to cast or budget or, you or, know, or genre things. or time of, yeah. of when it was released. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, genre, they usually kind of sure. align with, in, in terms of a business plan, but yeah, or time when it was released, right. It was released in the heyday of the eighties when, you know, we just talked about that or in the nineties, which had a, its own boom. Um, you know, the difference is, I mean, the difference between then and now is that there's a lot less business to business guaranteed transactions. Like when VHS and then DVD mm. were new, the the stores needed stuff and they were going to buy anyway. And now you just don't have that. In fact, now you have so much data that the platforms have themselves. They simply only license what they, you know, iTunes, anyone can get onto iTunes without you know, them curating you, if provided you meet the tech specs and other criteria like that, but it doesn't mean you'll sell a goddamn. Oh, no, ab right? absolutely not. And, and Amazon's purging right now. They're purging, like just whenever they feel like it, like, nope, sorry. And you're just gone because yeah. they don't, they don't need, they don't, they don't care. They don't care. They're selling socks. They make more money selling socks than they do dealing with independent filmmakers. Well, and they tried, let's get real. They tried to do an independent film initiative with the Festival Stars program. And it didn't Did last because it wasn't revenue generating enough. Presumably if it had been, they would have kept it going. Right. Yeah. And so, and so that's the other thing is like to be realistic about, you know, you know, at Film Collaborative, we really try to help folks um, get clear about where they are in the landscape. If you've made a film that would be a studio film, if only it had a much bigger budget, a top director who's, you know, famous and A-list cast. Well, but you haven't made that. You've made this other thing that, you know, how are people going to know it exists and what's going to motivate them to watch it? And then the answer is, you know, sometimes it's extraordinary and it's a breakout and that's a great thing. And and, and, and an A-list festival can help get you there. And sometimes that happens even without that. But still, you know, what's the data around that? And so, and just, and the other thing is, Filmmakers ask themselves, how many independent films do you view, right? Like not studio films, not series, just small films from not famous people that like that you're just like discovering and paying for or, you know what I mean? Right. And so that's when people get really real about it. But again, I kind of don't I, 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 I have a scrutiny in that speech, but I also understand because they want to make their work, their artists. And we don't have that kind of funding support in this country. They're just going to get it financed privately and then try to figure it out. Right. And you said something earlier, and I want to kind of touch on this because there's a myth out there that I'd love for you to help me debunk a TVOD, a transactional video on demand. Everyone thinks that all they need to do is go to an aggregator uh, and and put their films up on iTunes, Google, Amazon, and, and they will be discovered because their film is genius. And... The world of TVOD, we'll get to SVOD and AVOD in a minute, but TVOD in, and I have examples of films making half a million, $3 million off a, off a transactional, but two things have to happen. One, one of those examples was in 2010 and they were one of the first movies on iTunes and they had a TV star in it and they were two very popular um, directors. So that's, and that's out, that's the outskirts. Um, but the other one is you, it, TVOD only works if you have an audience that you can drive to it that actually generates, that actually is willing to pay, purchase, or rent your film. That's the only way TVOD works unless you're a studio. For independence, I feel that it's pretty much dead. What do you think? I think you're right. Every distributor that I've talked to, um, well, I mean, they're not saying like it's completely dead. There's still business. Oh, no, trickles. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just not the boon that it it was for some in the beginning. Cause again, when, you know, I mean, when cable VOD was a new thing, that was a big piece of business. And that was like the biggest part of video on demand revenue. And we were ahead of the whole world in terms of video on demand revenue. And then of course the transactional platforms like Apple and stuff like that. And 
you know, there was a time when that was a reasonable amount of revenue for certain films with the marketing traction with the audience. Now it's completely really, really, really died down because, um, there's just so much content available for no extra charge to the, to the audience on, you know, that's streaming or AVOD and, you know, people just don't feel the need to pay for anything other than, you know, the big studio stuff, or maybe some stuff for kids where they want to be able to keep watching it. And, and it's not on a streaming service, um, or watch it without ads, whatever it is, but it's very, yeah, the revenue now for independent films on TVOD is very low. It's the lowest it's ever been. I, there are exceptions, but they sort of prove the rule. I know that there is one film that a company is taking on that is, you know, very VOD focused and that film is a low budget indie, but it happens to have people in it with huge social media followings that are very right. supportive. Right? right? It's got to have that or a niche. Right. And I, you know, like free solo is a doc that I think did quite well on TV. Like it's got to have a thing, you know, sports enthusiasts, enthusiasts of a certain subculture, right. Where people really want to rent it and buy it. And that's all that's available at the time, right? There's, there, there's the window created to make people to drive those sales. Yeah. If you don't have, if you're just that small, would be a studio movie if only had a bigger budget with a famous director. <laughs> and, and you have no like clear marketing hook, even the niches that used to be such a slam dunk, like LGBT, which, you know, I know a lot about, I've worked for two LGBT distributors. We have a lot of those films that film collaborative. I'm a lesbian, you know, like it's like something mm -hmm. I really know about. Mm -hmm. Even that is no longer like a slam dunk, like any movie will work well because the, 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 the population is not desperate for the content anymore as it once right. was. Right. So, yeah, because I mean, I, and you know, in my book, I talk about the power, the only power I feel that filmmakers have, especially small indies is niche that you can, you can target an audience that is very passionate about a subject matter. And that cuts through a lot of marketing that, It'll cut through a hundred million dollars worth of marketing of the studio stuff because I always use the example. I'm a vegan, so when that that uh, Game Changers came up, yeah. I was just clamoring to see the, the Game Changers documentary when it came out, which is about athlete vegan athletes, which it was brand new. No one had ever really done anything or at least marketed properly, yeah. and it did have some heavy hitters behind it. it. Had James Cameron and Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jackie Chan, and a couple other big executive producers behind it. But I was clamoring, and everything just wiped away all these other content. I was like, I need, when is this release? And I paid for the rental. And then of course, yeah. three weeks later it was on Netflix. So I was like, son of a, but I, but they didn't tell you that, but they didn't tell you that. Right. And it was also, but I was also very passionate about that. So that is, I think the only hope we have as independent filmmakers is to do like LGBT is, is a subgenre. And if you're able to, to focus on that and, and target that audience and really build something that's a value to that audience. That's the only hope you have. You can't make a broad comedy anymore. You can't make a broad, you know, drama. I mean, unless, listen, I mean, oh, I want to. At the indie level, at the indie, like low budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, Game Changer is, you know, great oh, fantastic. example, but a lot of money went into that too. I mean, that movie was not marketed just with like grassroots. There was like. Real oh, oh, no, that was a big, that's a big example, but I'm just using the concept of the niche. Yeah, like, 100%. Be and, but, and yet, I would say after you have a few movies within the niche, it's not enough to just make the movie in the niche. So, right. so, so that was a unique movie at the time. And I don't know if there's anything since, but uh, there's for others, other niches, there are plenty of movies that are, that are covering, you know, the subject. I mean, but there's plenty of different niches, you know, different interests, like musician type, you know, music interests, ballet, uh, sports, you know, BMX, by, I mean, there's, there's so much, you know, cannabis. I mean, but, but then, and then it's also like, what else is happening within that niche? And is your work going to really satisfy and, and, and is it going to really, you know, and then, and then there's that, you know, just building community around the film early on and, and knowing that if you're not going to have a hundred million dollars, you're going to need to spend a lot of time to reach, even though it's a more streamlined approach. I'm with you. I'm all about, we're all about niche and our case studies mm -hmm. evidence that uh, now broad comedy. I mean, a hundred thousand dollar broad comedy with nobody in it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, unless it's something that's going to go viral because it's so fun. But that's but those are outliers. Those are those are lottery yeah. tickets. Those are the outliers. And if you're that talented that you can make that, then you're going to be successful, even if you even if that movie isn't successful because you're going to get discovered and you're going to become a comedy writer. Right. Right. Or comedy director, whatever. Exactly. But uh, you know. The, the, Again, the niche is the thing that I feel that low budget independent filmmakers have a chance. If you can make a series, and that's the thing now, right now, is series. If you can create 
long form series, like even six episodes broken up 20 minute episodes. That is more valuable right now in the marketplace. Would you agree? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, I think the the marketplace is looking for series, but at the same time, making a series that nobody consumes is also not useful. So right. if, if the if the work doesn't lend itself to be a series, but it no, really of works course. as a film, then, you know, because that's a struggle. I think, you know, it's also like, it's not like all the platforms are just buying up every series that's available, right? They have their pick and they're buying very little relative to what's available, mm-hmm. right? Relative to how much they could buy. So, uh, but I'm with you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a time for series. And if you have a series that's what they want, that's a great thing. But there's plenty of docs. And I think, um, and, and uh, in terms of comparing doc features to doc series, the good news is with docs, there's also so much financial support that is philanthropic that you can get your work made and have it be the right format for the work and not, and then, and then even have impact. I mean, we're all about distribution that, that is not about money making, but impact. We're launching a global VOD distribution initiative that is looking to philanthropic and corporate support to get movies out into the world for creating impact without it needing to generate revenue and have the, the support that came into making the film simply extend to releasing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but back to the broad comedy, then there's no issue there. Right. So it's like, we're back to like, what kind of content are you making and how are you going to find an audience for it? If it's an issue oriented film, if there's a niche, these kinds of things, you can see a marketing plan. Uh, if it's just, if it's just entertainment, I don't want to say just, then, but, but but it is just because there's like I mean I I go on night and every night I go to Netflix I got Hulu Netflix Amazon Disney Plus I go through them like what am I gonna watch tonight and sometimes I literally watch because there's so much new stuff but I can't this is what this is my this is my and please tell me what yours is when you're scanning through your streaming services if you see something that you're familiar with either an actor or a genre specifically an actor uh, or a director or something like that you'll feel more comfortable going to that because you just feel comfortable. That's why Adam Sandler has a career. It's He's one of the biggest stars on Netflix because anytime you skip by and you go, oh, that's an Adam Sandler movie, I know exactly what I'm going to get with an Adam Sandler movie. There's no surprises unless you're watching Punch Drunk Love. Other than that, it's generally – and that's why – and people – might not admit it in public, but they're like, you know what? This is just going to be silly and funny. And and like that new one, he just said Halloween, a Hoobie or whatever. Huge. They're like going to make a sequel for it because it was such a big, big hit. But, but when you're going through, like for me to trust an unknown is tough for me. And even if I do give it a shot, I give them five minutes. And if they don't get me, I'm out. So that's why it's so difficult to stand out. As opposed in the 90s, do you think El Mariachi, Clerks, Slacker, um, brothers McMullen. Do you think they would ever find a voice today? Just no way. I agree with you. I agree with everything you've said. Um, I do. One thing you didn't mention, I think, is also true. I'm sure for you too. Like Schitt's Creek, a show I would have never yeah. Yeah. known about, heard about. Um, but it's it's also because of a social media phenomenon or word of mouth. I do think there's that that's happening now, which is like there's so many series. I mean, if I did nothing but watch the content available, I would run out of time before I died. Of course. Um, and if I lived a very long life. So, you know, you just kind of like what's, you know, people are raving about this and that. And you know. But yeah, no, they're all the platforms. All the platforms have their, their, I mean, look, and speaking of like niches, look at Disney Plus. Yeah. What Disney did is, I mean, we saw it coming and we all kind of felt like this, 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 there's something here, but they just have killed it. They are, they're taking over and they just released, I think a few weeks ago, that release that we're like, yeah, we're restructuring our entire business model for streaming. Yeah, because yeah. they go. This is the future. This is where it all bit. And you just heard yesterday they released that um, Wonder Woman. Yeah, on HBO for free on December twenty fifth. That's a what one hundred fifty million dollar film. I mean, wow. That if I mean I know COVID is up has definitely fast tracked all this stuff and forced us to do it. But yeah, I mean the business model solid. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's different. You no, know, the technology is there, especially in this country, but it's also obviously developed in many other parts of the world, mm-hmm. and where people are home, and it's working, and actually, it's less expensive. It's less expensive than doing a theatrical campaign. So, you know, um, yeah, I'm with you. I have some 
Disney stock. I've actually, you know, like I'm happy. Like good. Disney's doing well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think, and so, and then there are the times when it's back to the COVID thing where an indie filmmaker, I mean, if you just think about like the filmmakers who got their careers because of having a short or a feature break out at Sundance or they mm -hmm. get discovered there. I do think that's another thing that's going to be challenging now is the discovery. But the thing is though, and I've been kind of breaking down the Sundance myth for a while. It's like, that doesn't happen as much anymore. It's not the night, like in the nineties, it happened every month. I felt that there was a new story, a magical mythical story. But now like, I've, I haven't heard of a lot of short filmmakers breaking out of Sundance. I know many Sundance winners who didn't make money on their films and they're still struggling to get their next gig. Like it's not the automatic golden ticket that it was in the nineties, you know, like. I don't think it was an automatic golden ticket in the nineties. I just think there were enough successes that your odds were better than they are now. I definitely agree with you The It's definitely not that anymore. Now on the happy note, um, there's so many more buyers than there've ever been, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Right, and um, and it's less expensive to make the work and less expensive to distribute it. And there's so many more buyers. And then there's also a real push for diversity. And there's I'm seeing my clients on the legal side, like people getting jobs that they might not have gotten in the past. Not that they didn't deserve it, but you know what I mean. Given opportunities that they were overlooked for, they shouldn't have been overlooked for. And I right. think that that's what's great now. So there's a plus side. Uh, Oh no, ab absolutely. And there's so much more opportunity now, but you've, this is what I feel that the, a lot of filmmakers now, and I see this in my work on a daily basis. I see filmmakers making movies, producing films, thinking that the, di the distribution landscape is set up like it was in the nineties. Like that's their, bi the business model is set up like, Oh, we're going to do this and we're going to get this amount of money. And there's these pre-sales and like, it was tough be Jan in December 2019. It was tough, let alone now. Like now, nobody even knows. The business plan literally looks like it was written in the 90s. Like I've seen that. Right. I, mean, I, I worked for someone who, in, <clears throat> even in the 2000s, uh, had mo you know a conception for the films that were way overblown, where like the budgets were twice as big as they should have been relative to how much money could be made. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think people need to adjust, and they need to get honest. I mean. I do think that there's sometimes a willful blindness on the part of the filmmaking community oh, because it needs to raise money and it needs to not feel, you know, you know, like it's not doing the right thing. And then it just becomes, you know, and if you're investing in film, you just need to know that you might not see your money back. And that's OK, as long as you know that and you're happy to support it. should People putting money behind film should be doing it not because they're going to get rich, but because they want to support the artists. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought of an interesting model of invest in the artist for a period of time right like imagine if you would invested in you know carrie fukunawa or chris nolan like you know what i mean like back in the day before when they first made their first films um so I, I i think that's another business model that i've just sort of fantasized about that i've never employed but i i do think that what you're talking about of people like just deliberately not uh inquiring as to what the economics of film are today it's just it's it's foolish. Like, I, I mean, I talked to a filmmaker the other day. He made half a million dollar horror movie with one um, older horror star that only horror fans would know. And it was a half a million dollar movie. And I, and they're like, where can I go? I'm like, you're never going to get that money back. Like, they have no audience. Horror is a very glutted it, genre. I mean, I'm no horror expert, but when I've, I've sold some horror in the past and the distributors will tell you there's a, it's a, there's a glut. I mean, there are deals to be done in the space. half a about half a million for no no stars and it's like it's gonna and it was well produced it's like a well produced nice horror but that i would go look if you could have made that movie for a hundred seventy five you, you could probably make a profit but you know right, unless there's something about it i mean i, I recently again breakouts that was about that level of deal but it, it involved other elements i think right there's got to be there's way too many of those movies. There's way too much of that content unless you have something that's going to break out and, and there's a reason that it's going to be special um, and make that and generate that revenue. Because, I mean, there are, there are still pre-sales, but for cast-driven films. It has right? to be cast-driven. It has to be cast-driven. And, 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 and the genre stuff is also quite, I mean, it's still in demand, but there's so much of it that it's like there's a lot more that isn't sold than there is that is. Yeah, w without question. Now, we talked about TVOD. The SVOD world is pretty much 
I mean, people now the golden goose is not DVD, but getting that Netflix deal and getting that Hulu deal or getting, you know, those kind of deals. And those are lottery tickets nowadays. I mean, again, Netflix isn't buying a whole lot of, I mean, you tell me better than, but they're not buying a whole lot of, especially independent films. They, they stopped that for a while ago. Right. And Amazon isn't either. You've got to have a very big cast. Yeah. You have to have a very big cast if they're, if they're even going to look at it. Well, or you have something that they want to adapt to be something bigger, or you right. have something that fits a niche that, 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 that tracks their data well, really well. I mean, they're very data driven. Um, I mean, they're, they're buying, but they're buying very, you know, I have a client that, whose movie they bought. Um, there's also, you know, it's a global market for them. So there could be content that really works. Um, that isn't, wouldn't work here necessarily, but it's going to work in different parts of the world. That's a big, you know, a market that they're developing. Right. So I, I, I don't want to completely undersell the ability to sell to Netflix, but it's certainly the case that, I mean, most movies out of most festivals, they will not buy. So. Pe- right, pe- pe- like, that whole thing of like going to a good festival, even Sundance, you can go and not get sold at all, let alone to Netflix. So, and just being a tiny little movie uh, without other clear elements that they're looking. I mean, because the best way to know about what Netflix wants is what Netflix has, right? What if they just like you know scroll through everything they have that relates to your movie and see what it is, and then you'll you know, uh, I mean, obviously they could have stuff that's no longer tracking well, but they're very data driven and. Um, you know, I've, I've sold to them before and, and yet I've been told no a bunch too. And there's no sales agent who hasn't been told no a bunch by them and right. by every, by every single big platform. I, and, yeah. No, I just want filmmakers listening to understand like that. That's a goal, but that's not a business plan. There's no guarantee. There's not even a high probability. You have to, it's kind of like winning Sundance or excuse me, getting into Sundance. Like the probabilities are hard. So you have to adjust that. You know, I always try to talk about, I always try to be real and raw about the truth with a, hopefully with a positive swing, but I just don't, they're going to get, I've been saying this lately, like you're going to get punched in the face. Okay. Like we all get punched in the face in this business. It's, we're all going to get it. It's the difference between I'm going to tell you I'm going to punch you in the face and you're seeing the fist coming to you slowly or getting cold cocked. That's how, and I just want you to be prepared for it when you get to it. Cause I've been, I've got a lot of shrapnel as I'm sure you do as well in this business. Yeah. No, and it's been nice to hear you talk about your sort of tough talk. Cause I actually am the same, I'm very, you know, straight talking New Yorker. Who yes. Doesn't mince words. And, you, and sometimes I get thanked for being so honest. I often get thanked for being so honest, but I do think occasionally it's, you know, received as just sort of negative and I, mm-hmm. I don't want to be that, but at the same time, I really don't want to participate in, um, any false, you know, assumptions and any puffing that is going to lead to people being disappointed later. Um, so I rather err, err, err on the side of being a little tough, but, um, you know, I, I just yesterday had a conversation with someone who I was like, look, I, I don't see a big international potential for this. And they were explaining to me what they do. And I, I always say, I'd love to be wrong. But, and I, I really don't mean this in an ego way, but I really am. And I really, I think when those words come out of my mouth, I don't think I've ever once been wrong where I've made a statement like about and, and then been proven. And part of it's also people... Um, they don't think of it in terms of, okay, like actually how many films are submitted to Sundance and how many are selected, how many films are pitched to Netflix, how many are selected and what are they buying? Um, I talk about, you know, whether this film will work internationally, like what does that actually mean? Like how, you know, the buyers need to buy it in order for the audiences to be given the opportunity to see it. And is that likely how many American films are they buying in the first place? What types at what prices? And it's that kind of stuff that, People are, they're not looking at the business of it all, right? Not <laughs> right. In, in, and, the, and the math behind it, like the sheer volume of competition. Um, and what they're doing is, is um, what they're doing is focusing on all the positive press that they've read over the years of people just being, you know, their film. <laughs> the lottery tickets, the lottery tickets. But they haven't thought about all the, the, the entrance, right? All the tickets that weren't, uh, that weren't winners. Lottery ticket. Look, I always say every week someone wins the lottery, but every week millions of people don't, and they only show you the lottery ticket winner. And that's what they show up because that's the good marketing. If they just said, Oh, another 200 million people didn't win the lottery this week. No one would buy a lottery ticket. 
and a lifelong amount of money spent by people pursuing that and not never getting it right how many people could have been better off saving that money and getting interest (laughs) on it or even investing it in the stock market buying a house and renting it like i mean there's look if you're in this business this is not a money making i mean it is but there are so many other places that are better suited to generate revenue you're in this because you love it and you you have a spark of madness in you i mean we all are a bit crazy just to to be in this business and the ones that we like you and i have been in it for you know many years we're we're, we should be certified (laughs) certifiable at this point because there's no excuse we know better but for some for people young coming in you know it this is you have to be a little mad and that's okay because this is an artistic medium and artists are crazy in the first place and you have to look at things differently and you have to be outside the box and you have to because that's what makes art art but i feel that you know you were you were saying something earlier that triggered a, a thought in my head which was filmmakers are taught in film schools and by hollywood that you need to worry about the craft and they teach you how to to bake the cake but they have no idea and they never teach you how to sell the cake they never teach you how to build a a, a bakery that actually is profitable. They just show you like, look at the cool fondant. Look at the business, right? They're also a business. If they told you that all the tuition you were paying to school might be a big fat risk, but I'll also say this. I'm never surprised anymore by the power of a passionate filmmaker. Mm. I do think, you know, it's important to combine the passion with empowered knowledge um, and, and, and be, and be real. But when people are absolutely obsessed with with getting success, they often do. It just might not be exactly the version that they thought initially, right? The Netflix things and everything just happen like that. But I will say there is something to be said for, I mean, especially when they're talented. I mean, the, the intense passion without any talent is a little bit not great. But um, <laughs> if you're very talented and you're very passionate, you know, often, more often than not, good things will come from that. It's just maybe not exactly how you first envisioned. Mm-hmm. I also want to be clear about the, the, you know, just back to Netflix. I mean, I worked at a distributor with a distributor that sold to Netflix before they even had a streaming service. There was a great boom back then because similar to the, you know, model of the, of the retail stores buying physical media, they were buying stuff just to have it to offer to build their business. So every so often there's a new version of that, Right. There, you know, VHS and then DVD and then Blu-ray and then VOD. And there was a window of time where there was a lot of business being done just because the business was being built up and people needed stuff. It's just that that we've passed that. And the question is now what's next? Because it's hard to imagine yet another thing. And like Quibi was in an interesting experiment that obviously failed. And I think it was probably destined to fail regardless of pandemic, but then the pandemic happened. And I do, I do think that, um, you know, on the positive side, there is kind of these like every every 10 years or whatever, every number of years, another kind of boon in the business that keeps things going and another boon of people willing to invest in it. Right. It was like real estate people, dentists, I'm forgetting the order or dot com people. Right. There's like new boons of people. It's a sexy, attractive space to be in. Um, crazy people attracted to it all the better. Um, but. So there's, but, but not all, you know, where are you in that landscape, right? In terms of, so I guess what I'm getting at is I think people always find a way to get their movies financed and made, Mm -hmm. and then they always find a way to get them distributed to some extent, but they do need to be, I think they need to be real about, um, not to assume that it'll come from an easy A-list festival acceptance and an easy big SVOD deal. Right. Or, or just an easy distribution deal, which there is no such thing as an easy distribution deal. (laughs) And, and many distribution deals these days are, yes, we'll take all your rights for 10 to 15 years and we'll give you no money up front and we will recoup expenses. And if it's successful, you'll make some money or not. maybe, maybe, right. Right. Depends on the deal, right. Depends on their expenses and, and how much money they're allowed to recoup and what their distribution fee is and whether they're accounting honestly and accounting at all. all that, all that, you know, I mean, <laughs> listen, I've seen it all. I've seen people just stop accounting, you know? Oh yeah. Or, or uh, the hip pocket deals or, Cross collateral, uh, collateralization, and there's so many little little things that you can do in a deal to make sure you never get paid. Um, Layer of middlemen that you didn't know existed if mm-hmm. you weren't smart to figure it out, right? They actually don't do any VOD on them. So they, this happened quite a bit where the companies didn't do the video on demand on them, themselves, and someone else did, and that company took a fee and 
You oh, know, and, or, and it just keeps going and keep. You'll never make it. You'll never make a dime. Or the the with cross collateralization with the Walmart buybacks. Like, you, who's going to eat that? Not the distributor. You're going to eat that. If, if that's in the contract, the, you're you're eating it. You're eating it now. But what you were saying, like, there's always that next thing. I feel that it was TVOD, then it turned into SVOD, but I do I do believe now a, it's AVOD. Yeah, a- AVOD is the thing now that where where filmmakers are making money. But if you notice, and everyone listening, from VHS to AVOD, the 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 ROI has dropped substantially. Oh. Oh, so it's not. It's because AVOD isn't like a okay. So when Tubi, you know, launched, I mean, first it had, I think, films not even through licensing, but, you know, it was a boon. A lot of filmmakers got on there. And similar to what you're saying, like when you're early on the platform, there's going to be of a money. nice big check. And distributors who had, I mean, that's why distributors take, you know, rights for so long, because every time there's a new transition in the marketplace, they have a big basket to deliver. And, you know, they get in early, they make money. Um so there were people, there were a lot of people that I think did well early on, but now they're getting just a selected, right? And the same stuff is, that was true before, just like with Netflix, where in the beginning it built up to, you know, um, curate for indie film lovers to get people to subscribe, didn't need to do quite as much of that. Same thing, right? All of a sudden, Tubi is focused on more commercial stuff. Not everything is going to get on there. Not everything is going to transact. Not everything is going to get on the homepage. You know, it's it, it's so... Uh, Amazon... Mm. Time was also a big boon for films for a while. Well, yeah. The, well, Stars Initiative was awesome. Then that was discontinued. Prime changed its 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 rates right down to one cent. Um, you know, it's so. I th- I think if you're a distributor, you're going to keep chasing where the money is and have make a living because you have a lot of volume. Where you're the individual film, if you don't, if you're not a, a commercial film or a film with a very clear niche. You're just not going to thrive. But I mean, from so from the from the inception of the film industry to let's say the late seventies, early eighties, the distribution model was fairly the same. It didn't really change. You made a movie, you went out theatrical, you maybe redo a reissue every few years, and that that was basically the way. And then maybe and then TV showed up, and then we could sell the rights to TVs, and there was foreign sales, but it was all fairly stable. Then VHS showed up, and that was the first kind of shift, really major shift. But then it was a slow, we're talking a decade, 15 years, then DVD. So as you notice, as the time goes on, the the shift is much shorter. Now it's monthly. <laughs> but it's not, you're you're choosing to break out the VOD category with, with uh, the types of VOD. And I will just say that really, if you think about it, TVOD is... DVD, but less expensive. Right. S five is TV, but mm-hmm. in a different place. Correct. And A five is TV, but in a different place. Right. A five is just the TV with ads, and S five is cable. You know. Right. It's-, it's just online. It's just a different version of it. But I remember when AVOD was a dirty word. Like you went to AVOD if you were you had nowhere else to go and you had right. exhausted. Right after you've done everything else. Now it's I know distributors are going straight to AVOD. Like. I think it depends on the movie. Yeah. Right. I think there's some films that are still doing it kind of traditional in that there is enough business potential to do, to do transactional first or and, and or there's enough of a big S5 sale potential that that's going to happen instead of AVOD mm-hmm. um, or, or AVOD would happen only after that window, you know, but, but yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I think that, that's right. And I, and that's why it's important to stay on top of what's happening in the business and where your film fits in with that. Right. So in other words, just hearing that AVOD's a big boon now, it's not for everything. So are you making a film that lends itself to that? And is it going to come out in time? <laughs> you know, and then the other thing is there's a big surge in home entertainment revenue and VOD um, that's happening under COVID. Well, what's going to happen when there's a vaccine released and, and things shift? You know, again, yeah, when are, things shift again. again. Are people going to like be like, OK, I was in my house for a year. Now I'm not turning on the, well, I doubt that's going to happen. But, no, 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 it won't. But that's a good question though. So do you think th- the theatrical obviously in business has completely been devastated. And even when this, when we get out of COVID and let's hopefully, let's say within the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, maybe completely out back to somewhat of normalcy. I, many of those screens are going to be gone. They just, they didn't make it during this time. 
So the screen capacity is going to be less, though I think someone will buy these screens and, and maybe do something with it. But <clears throat> do you think that it's going to get to where it was before? Because it was already going down. I mean, if you pull Marvel out of the last 10 years, there is the box office would be in a very bad shape. So it, it was definitely on its a downward slope, but this just just accelerated everything. Yep. Do you think theatrical is going to be what it once was, even at 2019 levels? No, I have no reason to think that. I think that I do think that in the same way that we'll probably see a lot of flying happen after the pandemic is behind us. I do think that you know for the studio films, it'll be super glutted. That sure. there'll be a ton of business, great business for the studios, but for the independents. Um, no, I think if anything, people will just have been trained to see that much more of that content, if at all on at home and that there won't be a reason, a good enough reason to go out. I mean, I, you know, I think festivals will still be thrive, will thrive and event screenings and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the decline that was already happening to theatrical generally, especially for Indies, there's no reason that should be reversed. Yeah. I don't, see, I don't see that at all. And it doesn't even make sense because you know, a lot of the time the home experience, other than not being communal, is no worse technologically than depending on where the, what theaters we're talking about. Um, so sometimes right. it could be superior. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, but I think the community experience of a festival and community screenings yeah, and, yeah, and event theatricals and all that stuff, especially that work for niches or issue oriented films or certain kinds of community communities, all that stuff will, will be, I, I think people wish it could be happening now. Um, and it'll go back, but, but, but a theatrical indie hit that's like, oh, this tiny little three million dollar movie generated way, way, way more times than its budget. I think that will be, it'll happen, but I think it'll be rare. All right. Now I have to ask you: Can you give me an example of the best distribution deal that you've ever been a part of or seen, and the most predatory that you're like, I can't believe this person is walking the earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I can say is I'm very proud of how much right splitting I did uh, for one film, uh, you know, where we actually turned down. A, I'm not going to name the name of the film, sure. because I don't want, but we turned down a, in this case. It's very rare for me. I think it's the only time I turned down a worldwide Netflix deal into instead do a very significant uh television deal and another very significant VOD deal, both, you know, real money and then an airline deal and then a home video deal and then additional educational distribution and additional, um, and then a number of territory sales and, and tell additional television sales. So that, that it was that it was like so much right splitting that was successful where mm -hmm. the film, the film did festivals for over two years and made a whole bunch of money that way through film collaborative. And so, uh, that was where each distributor was willing to do what it did best and let everything else be carved out and have a really wonderful, robust combination of deals. And I've done that to different extents a few times before. Mm -hmm. um, I love the giant entertainment, giant pictures uh, deals of just three years. I think giant is kind of a hybrid between aggregator and distributor. I don't think they would purport to do a ton of marketing, but they're not absentee about that. They're just sort of would partner with people on marketing. So I, I, I've done those deals that I think are wonderfully, like beautifully filmmaker safe, mm. um, you know, and then there's just a whole bunch of other in between, right. We're like, ah, the, the distribution deal wasn't totally predatory, but it wasn't totally amazing, right. The distributor didn't like do incredible stuff, but, there, but there's other good deals that I've done over the years that are, that I'm, that I'm, I could say the distributor did everything that they said they would do. Now, in terms of, I mean, the most yeah. predatory, like the most predatory thing you, when you read it, you were just like, oh my yeah, God. I, I mean, Green Apple's deal uh, is predatory. Oh, wow. You know? Okay. What is, what is Green Apple? Yeah. And I mean, maybe they'll sue me for saying it, but that's okay. I think it's predatory. I, charging a marketing fee of 30 grand, I think, is in their contracts. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I, you know, taking right. I mean, that's, it's, the, it's that kind of thing to me when you have marketing fees, I mean, it's one thing for a sales agent to have a market, a, a, a market fee, 
saying, okay, instead of us doing this account, this complex accounting of figuring out exactly what, how to amortize, you know, how to prorate, we're just going to charge this thing. I, st I still think you drill down into that and you don't just accept it at face value. But, but, you know, when you're just like taking filmmakers' rights without promising anything in return in terms of the degree of release, the marketing to be done, right? There's no actual commitment unless, you know, a lawyer made them change their contract, which I'm not sure they would. And you just on its face, the contract is like, yep, we're taking your rights. We're going to bill back to a $30,000 marketing fee and not make any promises. And how was the, what was the length of the, what's the length of the deal? 10 year? Uh, I don't, cause I never, I mean, my clients never did that deal with me having been their lawyer prior to that, but I've seen that deal after the fact, after people came to me after they signed it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was like, it was like 10, maybe, I, it was, I could double check, but it was more than seven. It was probably more like a 10 or 15 year deal. But even if it was, I, I'm, I'm almost positive it wasn't for five years, but the bottom line is I've heard the filmmakers complain later. They're unhappy, right? Nothing that they were told was going to happen happened. And you know, they're never going to see a penny because there's not enough money coming in to, sure. I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying that the distributor isn't capable of distributing the films. I'm just saying the deal on its face is almost always going to be hideous for the filmmaker. If, and, and frankly, I don't even understand the logic behind simply charging that kind of a fee without doing the marketing uh, with, you know, without having a, a real promise and commitment that's worth that. Yeah, like, or break it down. Like, you know, like we're going to buy fifteen thousand dollars of Facebook ads, and we're going to get some billboards, and we're going to do this kind of thing. I, I, I would bet money that that never happens, right? They never actually spend thirty thousand dollars. No, of, of course not. No, that's well. And, and nowadays, like before, it was like, oh, we go to the markets, we go to Can, we go to Al okay, but No one's no one's flying anywhere. That's the other thing I'm seeing in sales agent deals. Those same, the, you know, where I said it's not necessarily unreasonable but you need to drill into it. It's like, you're not going anywhere. There's no flying, there's no booth, there's no nothing. It's never been less expensive to do sales in a, you know, cause it's a virtual market. Not to say that that will stay forever, but that's the thing is don't just sign these things. So, you know, and I tell filmmakers, the term is not to me the biggest issue. Not because I love doing long terms. I love giant for their three-year terms, but not to say that just because a distributor has a seven or 10 or even 15 year term, that's so terrible because there's a logic behind it for, for, from their perspective, but also the value of the film really like a car really goes down so fast, right? After it's been released a year or two later, very few films are generating enough money for it to be that, for it to be the big thing. But so then, is, so then why hold it for so many years? Well, because of what I said earlier, right? from the distributor's perspective, A, they will have spent money on it so they want to not be at risk of not recouping and making money but also because of that um then they have a nice life every time there's a new thing they have a basket to start with i mean that's a good thing if you're a distributor like netflix launches great i've got 50 or 100 movies i can license you to be great like they're in the best position if they didn't keep their rights for a long period of time they wouldn't have that library right, right. but that's not um, helpful to, not helpful to the filmmaker it's more helpful to them well, it, it it can be both. I mean, I again, I don't want it to be so. I don't want to be so tilted. Got it. It can be helpful to the filmmaker in that Tubi's not coming to individual filmmakers or right. you know Netflix. I mean, or you know, I'm not saying it never happens, but mostly these platforms, these new buyers, are only going to go to a place where they can get a lot of content at once, not just right. one offs, unless it's a really big one off. And in that way, the filmmaker is helped because it's an opportunity that otherwise they wouldn't get. It's just a question of under what terms. Um, and is their film going to be part of that or is it their film going to be, the question is what happens when that film just isn't doing any business anywhere five years into the term, will the filmmaker get their rights back? And the distributor will say, no, cause you know, we still wanted the opportunity to keep monetizing to the extent possible. And is the distributor doing anything to keep giving life to that film after, you know, the first year of release. So these are the things to drill into. What are you getting for giving up the rights for that period of time? Are they committed to always pitching your film to every platform? Are they really marketing thoroughly? Right. What are they doing? To the, to the consumers, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I had a deal. I was consulting once and they came to me with this deal, which was 20 year, $50,000 uh, marketing fee yearly. Oh, wow. Yearly, yearly, yeah. a, a 20 year. So she was like, oh, okay. So you a million dollars. So that's a million dollars over the course of the term. So that you're never, ever going to see a dime. And then we put, I go, let's just play a game. It was 25 years, excuse me, it was 25 years. 
25 year term. And I go, let's push back. Let's, let's see what happens. And we pushed back and they're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. 15 years and uh, 10,000 a year. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Yeah, it's in there. It's just in there. You know, and I, I, you know, some of the things I do understand from, like I said, I've been a d- distributor, but it's also true that even the distribution expenses, it was really expensive to make VHSs and DVDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's not expensive to do VOD. It just isn't right. I mean, I'm not saying it's free. I'm just saying it's hundreds of dollars or a few thousand. It's not per per platform. It's not, you know, and tens of thousands. Know, yeah. And don't put my film on a hundred platforms at my expense, unless it makes sense. Like, are, are oh, you know, yes. this film actually going to get onto those platforms and actually perform. Um, so I think those are the things to look to, but I, I just, you know, I think it's important. This is part of what the distributor pork is meant to do is not just only, have red flags and also, you know, happy, you know, blue ones, or whatever the color would be uh, for good, you know, for good and bad uh, work on distributors part, but to also have perspective on what, why things are the way they are and what, what you should push back on and what maybe isn't so necessary to push back on. You know, uh, I will say, you know, one ever wants to be in a Q media or tug or distributor like scenario where mm. you can't get your rights back when they become insolvent or file for bankruptcy. And similarly, I don't want to not be able to get my filmmakers rights back if the if there's uncured material breach, you know, but if the distributor has done everything they said they would do and honor the contract, but you simply haven't made as much money as you hoped, I Sorry. get that the distributor is not going to be happy to just hand you your rights back. Right. It's it, there's there's a balance. There's there's a balance with everything. Um, now, can you tell me really uh, what is film col- uh, collaborative and what what is it? What do you do with it? What's the work you do with it? It's a nonprofit that is focused on educating filmmakers about film distribution and facilitating film distribution without taking their rights. I founded it um, at the end of 09. We launched officially in 2010. And we have a lot of educational um, information on the website and in our books about distribution. I rec- recommend folks go to the filmcollaborative.org. Some of those t- you know, resources I've mentioned earlier today. Um, Speaking of research, we have something called Resource Place. Anyway, we have all that free educational information about distribution, and we also have membership um, uh, consulting services for folks if they want, like, you know, one-on-one or one-on-two, let's say two of us, to uh, watch the film and, and to advise about it, or three of us, it depends. We do festival distribution, I think, better than anyone. We, you know, help with the festival strategy. We submit the films to programmers that we know personally. There's no cold submission. There's no paying to submit. Um, and we also monetize the films on the festival circuit that can sometimes generate six figures, sometimes more often than not five figures uh, that we share that money with the filmmakers and they're, we're never taking rights. So any deal that's done with us can be canceled at any time. Um, and we also do sales, but in a very, very boutique fashion. So I don't want to oversell the sales practice, but we can definitely help with that service of pitching the right places and helping them do the deal and collaborate with the sales agent. Like we also play well with others. So if we provide a distribution service, but you're also working with, you know, you name it, the sales agency, or you want help doing international sales, which I don't do anymore very often um, on purpose. Um, you know, we'll pair you with folks that we think are trustworthy. So we basically can help with every single aspect of distribution uh, to one extent or you know, either completely or in part without taking rights. And we're launching the TFC Global VOD Impact Initiative that I mentioned earlier, which is that's going to be documentary focused. And that is going to be um, taking films that are that really are meant to have an impact around the world that are, um, you know, meant to educate and inspire an impact and getting them widely distributed, including on VOD platforms around the world. There's like 3,000 VOD platforms just in Europe. I'm not saying the film needs to be on all of them. I'm just saying there's a whole world out there that's not just the big S VODs that, you know, and, and, and T VODs and A VODs that we know of in the States. Um, but f- having films reach audiences around the world with a goal of impact, not revenue generation, and have the revenue come from philanthropy and corporate support. Very cool. I'm so glad there's something like you in the world. Uh, and I, I love to spotlight that kind of stuff. I've been. 
you know, I've been fighting the good fight over here for a while now, and uh, I'm glad that there's other Avengers out there. We have to unite <laughs> to take down predatory distributors and educate filmmakers as much as possible on on the process. I know I was just talking to a filmmaker yesterday, like, Alex, you saved me from going with this dribber. Like, I was literally a, about a day away from submitting and paying when you came out with your podcast and broke that story. And I'm like, oh, my God, I mean, you have no idea how make, that makes me feel. And being able to help filmmakers get their rights back or get their money back from that whole situation was so rewarding. But it is, you know, I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I tend to be sometimes a little bit too raw and too, um, too brutally honest. But I feel that the business is brutal. And I'd rather you hear it from me than you lose $500,000 on the movie that you borrowed your money or, or least, you know, took a loan out on your house for, which – I'm sure you've heard those stories and I have too. Oh, definitely. No, I totally agree with you. And I think what you did there was great. And we had a distributor like service and I'm really glad that we did not do to filmmakers or distributor did, but it made me rethink even our service to make sure because we were working with another service provider transparently mm -hmm. and a less expensive version of the exact same service and distributor. But I never want to be in that place if I don't have total control to make sure that they never get harmed. So we've adjusted that too, you know, yeah. and it's, um, no, it, what you're doing is great. And, you know, um, I think the thing is, at the end of the day, if filmmakers just get the knowledge ahead of time, right. they can make a choice. They can make a choice to proceed anyway, even knowing they might not make the money back or, you know, knowing they might not be discovered and become an A-list director, but at least know that what's possible and, and what it takes to get there and, and, and then, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy the process. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate everything you do at the film collaborative and fighting the good fight for the last 10 years now, uh, plus, um, working and helping filmmakers. So I appreciate you and thank you so much for coming on the show and, and dropping the knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much for hosting me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Good luck to everybody. Stay well. I want to thank Orly for coming on the show and dropping those distribution knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Orly. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to reach Orly, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 444. And if you haven't already, head over to IFHTV.com and check out the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers and screenwriters. We have over 2,200 videos there to help you on your filmmaking journey. Just head over to ifhtv.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.